Also, uh, uh, thank you and good evening to everybody. Um, let me just thank the organizer for having me today in this uh, very beautiful uh, location. As the, the chairman said, uh, um, uh, I'm, uh, I'm talking today, I'm talking about our uh, few last experiments about uh, Kelvin probe force microscopy. Uh, we apply this technique to um, organic transistors, particularly N-type organic transistors, for the investigation of the so-called contact resistances. Uh, just a brief uh, recap about organic semiconductors and organic transistors. Those are, uh, of course, polymer or small molecules. There has been a huge effort in the last, let's say, 30 years, especially in terms of the um, charge carrier mobility, field effect uh, mobilities that now range in about, uh, let's say, 10 to the 0 and 10 to the minus 1 and 10 to the 1 uh, centimeter square of a volt per second. So we are talking about something that is uh, far, uh, quite far from the uh, inorganic standards, for example, uh, silicon. Despite this, there is a huge landscape of application for this kind of uh, electronic devices, I mean, organic transistors. Uh, typically, whenever biocompatibility and or uh, flexibility is, uh, is uh, needed. Now, organic semiconductors are uh, intrinsic materials. That means that uh, the P-type and N-type classification is uh, strictly dependent on the uh, energy barrier building up between the LUMO and the HOMO level and the work function of uh, the electrode that is used. That means that the, the, the materials used, as well as the morphological, as we will see, the morphological features of the electrodes are quite important for the architecture, the transistor architecture. Now, there is a huge group of well-known P-type semiconductors, well-performing P-type semiconductors. On the other hand, the N-type are quite more hard to find uh, in a reliable form, and that's why we <laughs> focus the attention on N-type organic semiconductors. These are called PDIF and PDI8CN2, are both uh, perylene diamides derivatives with the electron withdrawing groups, the, the CN group on the side that lower the LUMO levels in order for electron to be uh, easily injected from, uh, from gold, that is the mostly the most widely used uh, electrode materials for this kind of uh, organic devices. Um, there are quite few uh, deposition techniques for the experiment that I will show you. We employed uh, organic molecular beam deposition technique that is simply thermal sublimation of the, of the material. We, uh, we fabricate, we fabricate uh, typically uh, very thin films of, uh, of those materials. The morphology are well known. We were talking about uh, highland plus uh, layer plus island uh, morphology. It's slightly different according to the materials that it used. And today I want to show you the results for two different. Ah, here we have some problem with the colors. By the way, uh, I want to uh, talk about these two different architecture, OFET architecture. The first one is a very typical one. So we have a very thick. Uh, gold electrodes in a coplanar bottom gate, bottom, co uh, bottom contacts uh, architecture with the, a distributed uh, gate contact beneath. The, the other one is uh, pretty, pretty nice. We employed uh, graphene, this time not as semiconductive material, but has, uh, uh, as uh, electrode materials, so exploited its uh, semi-metallic nature. Uh, very briefly, uh, organic transistors uh, in the best case scenario, so based to standard MOSFET model. So we have uh, the variation of a gate voltage that modulates the conductivity across the organic channel. The SARS electrode inject the charge carrier while the drain electrode extract them. Uh, the bottom pan, uh, from the bottom panel, you can see a typical electrical characterization of our state-of-the-art uh, PDIF CN2 based OFET. Uh, we, we managed to have a mobility of the order of ta five times 10 to the minus one, and we have this nice 
let's say, textbook output curves. Um, despite the state-of-the-art performances of our devices, there are still major drawbacks in OFETs, in our OFETs, but most, mostly in, uh, in every, in every, for every materials. I try to list the, the, what I think are the three major ones. Uh, of course, air stability, it's a very, it's a very big deal, for, especially for N-type OFETs, um, due mainly to the oxygen and water contamination that act like uh, uh, charge trapping sites. The very, very low intrinsic field effect mobility values, as I mentioned. And the third one that I will show you is the so-called contact resistances affecting, of course, uh, the electrodes, as you may imagine. Now, uh, contact resistances are parasitic effects um, that has a great impact on the total resistance of the, of the transistors. So we have a central channel contribution that, as you, as you see here, scales well with the channel length while the other two are channel independent contribution. That means that, for example, if we scale down uh, the architecture, uh, contact resistance may dominate over the entire, uh, the entire uh, device. The nature, the origin of, the, uh, of these effects are mainly due to the uh, energy barrier that I mentioned building up between the electrode and the, in the case of N-type uh, with the LUMO level. This is not uh, properly true. Actually, there is uh, an additional dipolar, dipolar uh, contribution that can be added or subtracted to the total, uh, total balance of the barrier. The origin of this uh, dipolar term, uh, uh, there, are, there are few uh, reasons why uh, is there. Uh, um, it depends strictly on the organic materials that it used, the architecture, and, and so on. Mostly, we can say that it's due to morphology at the contact, metal-induced gap state, or pushback effects due to image charge carrier building up at the very interfaces. Now, about the uh, measurements, the actual measurements, there are few techniques to estimate contact resistances. The, the first one and the easiest one, let me say, it's, it's the so-called uh, transmission line method. Uh, here we have uh, a bunch of OFETs with uh, different channel length, and the contact resistances are simply the intercept of the total resistance as function of the channel length, of course, for, for L approaching to zero. As you may imagine, this technique is, uh, is not direct in a direct estimation. We have a spatially averaged uh, values, and we cannot separate, most importantly, we cannot separate uh, the source contribution from the DRE contribution, and that's why uh, I want to talk about this other technique as, uh, as uh, uh, you, you, you notice, you, you, you saw that in, uh, in the previous contribution, scanning Kelvin probe force microscopy. In th this way, we, we have a direct uh, estimation of the surface potential. So we are measuring here the actual voltage drop, parasitic uh, voltage drops that occur at the interfaces. So the contact resistances can be uh, calculated simply by the ratio between uh, the the voltage drops and the, the current that pass through uh, the three series resistors, this one. Um, of course, we have a, a, a scanning probe technique, so we have a nanometric lateral resolution, it's a very local uh, technique. We can discriminate uh, pretty easily between the source and the drain electrodes. Um, now, we, we saw in the previous contribution how it works. Uh, let me just uh, uh, briefly recap here. Kelvin probe is based on the estimation of the contact potential difference, so we have a, a conductive tip approaching the sample. Uh, the work function between the two is different. Uh, a contact potential difference, VCPD, builds up. Uh, at the Kelvin probe, uh, um, uh, typically, um, um, simply uh, apply 
an external VDC bias in order to restore the equilibrium between the two. This is made point-wise, so we can map uh, the contact potential difference, difference all over the sample. In our case, we can uh, perform the so-called dual frequency mode uh, Kelvin probe. That means that we, we have uh, uh, two different signals at the same time. We, we, can, uh, uh, we can retrieve the, the, the topography and the surface potential map with a single raster over, over the same spot. Of course, we are talking about uh, non-contact mode uh, AFM related technique. We use our, our, our uh, good old uh, Park C100. We, we attached uh, a couple of uh, SARS meters. These help us to apply whatever, whatever we want uh, in terms of gate, uh, surface, uh, gate voltages. We can uh, range from, uh, let's say, minus 100 to plus 100 uh, volts. We are limited in terms of what the Kelvin probe can actually feedback. So we can measure surface potential that range in between uh, uh, minus and plus 10 volts. And this is what we typically observed in our perlin dimides offets. We have some issues here with the colors, but anyway, uh, this is a typical overview of the surface potential profiles. Here uh, you can see the topography. In this case, we are talking about gold-based architecture, so we have very thick gold uh, source and drain contact and the acti active channel in between. At the same time, we acquired the surface potential, of course, for, uh, by modulating the drain source bias. And first thing first, from a theoretical point of view, here in the inset, you, we can say that uh, we are talking about a double shot key barrier at the, source, at the source and drain electrode, but at the drain electrode we should have something that is directly polarized in contrast with the source electrode where, where, is, uh, where it is uh, uh, inversely polarized. So in principle, at least in principle, we should have no contact effects on the drain electrodes the surface profiles tell us a complete different stories. We do have very steep contact effects even on the drain electrodes and those are even higher than the source contact resistances when the drain source bias is uh, approaching zero. As you can see here, the drain, the triangles are even higher than the, the, the source contact effects. More than that, we, we analyzed the, the uh, variation as function of the applied gate source vo uh, uh, voltage, uh, observing that the modulation is pretty low, and this will be useful when we switch to, to the graphene case. Now, uh, we have uh, surface potential profiles. We can, we can uh, uh, switch to the analysis of the electric field ju just by uh, numerical derivation, uh, and so we did uh, for the same uh, for the same data set, and we plotted the current as function of the electric field at the very interfaces. So we are talking about uh, these points with the nanometric resolution. So we are reconstructing the current field characteristics of uh, the uh, interfaces only. Very interestingly, the transport mechanism that we, uh, that we reconstruct are quite different from the standard, standard MOSFET model. We observed something that is almost quadratic, indicating the presence of sp the so-called space charge limited conduction. Uh, and so uh, the, we can say that the electric field distribution has a great impact, especially on the electrodes in defining the transport properties and the injection and extraction phenomena. All these observation uh, brought us to some hypotheses. The first one is that maybe the, the polar terms that I mentioned was mainly due here by morphological reasons. Uh, we believe that uh, the very abrupt or the very uh, steep interruption at the contacts may play a role. Uh, we tried to eliminate this effect uh, in order to have uh, a comparison. And so we just asked 
uh, what if electrodes had, of course, we need the metallic behavior, uh, work function values that are uh, mostly compatible with the LUMO levels of the perlin amides, and but mostly important, uh, most importantly, the, a very low impact on organic thin film growth. And so, for that, we choose uh, graphene. Now, graphene, as you may know, uh, it's a very interesting material. It's an atomically thin uh, carbon uh, sheet. Uh, it is referred uh, uh, either as a zero band gap semiconductor or a zero overlap semimetal. We choose this second approach and we exploited another important property of, of uh, graphene that is the work function tenability across a, a, a medium point of uh, 4.6, at least theoretically of 4.6 electron volts just by field effect, so by modulating the gate voltage beneath. And so what happens if it's that we, uh, we, we get an additional degree of freedom at the interfaces. So we have that, uh, in this case, both the electrode and the LUMO level swings, swing up and down uh, um, and in opposite direction in, in the case of N-type organic semiconductors just by field effect. So we have uh, additional control over the interfaces, at least in principle. We test our graphene, uh, graphene uh, electrodes. In, uh, in this case, we firstly test it in, uh, in field effect transistor configuration. So in this case, graphene is the semiconductor uh, for the FET. Uh, graphene, uh, CVD graphene, large area CVD graphene is far from ideal. That means it, that is, it is uh, typically highly uh, p-doped. This is confirmed by Kelvin probe analysis. We try to map here uh, the work function all over a, a very broad area of uh, our electrodes. And we managed to uh, estimate, to have a rough estimation of the work function, at least for zero gate voltages, that is uh, about five electron volts. So we have something that is, uh, uh, that is uh, more similar to gold than to infrared zinc graphene, uh, at least the CVD graphene. Then we switched to the actual devices that you may see here, but graphene has no, uh, it's, uh, it's very transparent. It's very hard to, to see with the naked eye. Anyway, we deposited our uh, organic on the top of the final layout here at the center. We test our uh, OFETs with the graphene electrode. In, in this case, we used PDI8 CN2. Um, and uh, the, the, the devices, we can say that, that the devices uh, work, work pretty well. Um, as you can see here, we compared the field effect mobility between the gold and the graphene-based architecture, and they are quite similar, if not uh, uh, totally equal. Then we test the IFM morphology. We needed something that was almost transparent to the organic thin film growth. And so uh, that's what uh, we, we got here. As you can see, uh, organic semiconductors, uh, organic semiconductor does, does not see graphene at all. The organic thin film growth is uh, consistent on the graphene electrodes and uh, the channel. Then we moved to the Kelvin probe uh, analysis, and here we have something that is totally different to the gold case. As you can see here, uh, the drain interfaces are not affected at all by, by contact effects. Everything is focused on the, source, on the source interfaces, so we restored a truly injection-limited devices, and it should be uh, in theory. We analyzed the gate modulation at the source, and, and we observed that graphene electrode uh, gives a huge gate modulation in contrast with the gold case. And we have uh, a totally different behavior uh, as function of the applied drain source uh, voltages. And lastly, we try to, we try to uh, summarize everything, every observation in one single device with this very nice, very funny architecture here. Here we have one electrode made out of graphene and one, this one, that it's almost transparent, and the other one made out uh, made of uh, gold. Uh, 
So here it is possible to switch the injection between two materials on the same devices so we can have uh, a direct measure on the same spot. And so we did by Gelfin probe, as you can see here, the surface potential are uh, quite consistent with the two uh, previous observations. That means that we, if we inject, inject from uh, a graphene source, and uh, here the, the, the color code is quite messed up, by the way, if we, uh, if, if we inject from graphene source, we have drain on the uh, gold on the drain, and so we have uh, contact resistance. In contrast, if we inject from gold, we have no effects on the drain that in this case is made out of, uh, of graphene. And the general behavior as function of the drain source voltages are quite consistent with the, with the, the previous observation. And this brings, brings me to the conclusion of this uh, very short uh, dissertation. We saw how Kelvin probe force microscopy can be a very versatile and powerful approach, not only for OFETs, by the way, but for every, every uh, electronic, uh, almost every electronic devices. Um, we saw how morphology at the contact for OFETs and for N-type OFETs is, uh, uh, is a, a very big deal especially the drain interfaces. And we also see that graphene can effectively replace gold somehow uh, as uh, electron materials by exploiting, as I said, the work function tenability and uh, the, the, uh, the very thin, uh, the very low thickness of this kind of material. And very lastly, let me acknowledge uh, our group our organic electronic group from, uh, from the University of Naples and uh, CNR Spin. So, Dr. Mario Barra, Dr. Fabio Chiarella, and Professor Antonio Cassinese. The collaboration of the last few years with the, the CNR Nano Modena S3, the ESOF Institutes, and the IET that provide us the, the transfer of, gra of graphene on our samples. And uh, with uh, this nice postcard of my city, let me thank you for your kind attention.